Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to the Live Label Free Podcast. It has been a while since I did a solo episode on a dedicated topic, and with the amount of times today's specific topic has been coming up with clients, I figured it was about time I record an episode addressing the fear of becoming a sugar addict and developing diabetes as a result of honoring extreme hunger. You know, I hold nothing back when it comes to my story. I mean, if you've read Rainbow Girl, that's pretty much a given. And what I'll be sharing today is a perfect illustration of that. I ate so much sugar when I was going through extreme hunger that I genuinely believed I was creating a diabetes diagnosis for myself. I also thought I had made myself insulin resistant and that I was breaking my body even more by honoring my cravings. If you resonate at all, you're definitely going to want to strap yourself in for this episode because we're going to get into all of that and more. In fact, this podcast episode is actually inspired by my newest book, which I just got back from my editor, and it is called How to Beat Extreme Hunger. That book is probably the most scientific thing I have ever written, but for that reason, I'm also hella proud of it. One thing that I was truly missing during my own extreme hunger journey was a dedicated book on the topic. So because it didn't exist, I decided to write it. In my newest book, I answer every question I have ever been asked about extreme hunger and I back it up with science and lived experience. Not only do I explain the basics of the phenomenon and cover topics like weight overshoot, hormonal changes, the impact of the nervous system and the gut-brain connection, but you'll also learn about concepts that I've never really seen or heard talked about in relation to extreme hunger, including leptin and insulin resistance, PMDD, insomnia, And of course, because it's written by me, the Rainbow Girl, who's autistic, the entire book connects extreme hunger to neurodiversity and acts as a guide for feeling satisfied in every sense of the word. If you want to be the first to know when How to Beat Extreme Hunger comes out, be sure to get on the waitlist at livelabelfree.com slash extremehungerbook. I honestly don't know the exact date when it's coming out. I mean, sometime next year for sure in 2024. So if you're listening to this or watching this on YouTube, the day that this airs (laughs) towards the end of 2023, um, I mean, you're definitely going to want to get on the wait list because the book is coming out in 2024. And if you're on the wait list, you'll be the very first one not only to hear about when it's releasing, but Everyone who's on my book waitlist ever is always going to get exclusive bonuses and like pre-launch access just, you know, as a thank you for being on the waitlist and being as excited as I am. So again, the waitlist link is livelabelfree.com forward slash extreme hunger book. And now let's get into today's episode. Welcome to Live Label Free, the podcast, where you'll learn to let go of limiting labels and embrace your unique brain. As my mom says so beautifully in her song, Fear is a heavy load to carry. Which is why on this podcast, you'll learn the scientific links between neurodiversity and eating disorders, giving you a deeper understanding of how you can face your fears and become truly free. Together, you and me, we will keep putting one foot in front of the other. When I was overtaken by the wave of extreme hunger, all I wanted to eat was junk food. Cookies, cakes, ice cream, peanut butter, Nutella, Biscoff, granola, cereal. Every single food that had been off limits for years was now the only thing I could think about. And not in the, oh, it would be nice, but I can't have that kind of way that mental hunger had imprisoned me to. When I was experiencing extreme hunger, I would literally shovel aforementioned foods and more down my throat in milliseconds. With every binge, there was no stopping me. 
As soon as I'd cracked open the jar of nut butter or pulled open the metallic lining of the Oreo cookies, it was do or die. Eat, 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 until my stomach was so distended, so stuffed, so bloated, so round, that all I could do was lay down in agony. As I would lay there in utter exhaustion, my insatiable cravings had dimmed down only to have sparked a blazing mental fire. I told myself, that was the last time. I am so out of control. I have no willpower. These phrases were all rooted in fears, and not just the classic fear of waking, growing out of clothes, or being judged by others due to taking on a bigger body, but one of my greatest worries while experiencing extreme hunger was that I was becoming a sugar addict and that I would develop diabetes. It's not uncommon to read or hear articles saying how most people are addicted to sugar these days and that the key to preventing sugar addiction is to quit sugar. As if I hadn't tried quitting sugar already. I'd avoided sugar for years. I mean, as I write in my memoir, Rainbow Girl, I replaced any and all sweets with a healthier, light, and high-protein version. Cookie craving? No problem. I'll just have this delicious cookies and cream flavored protein bar instead. Cake craving? No problem. I'll just mix a scoop of protein powder with oat flour and almond milk, mix it up, pop it in the microwave, and say, Wow, this tastes just like the real thing. Nutella craving? No problem. I'll just make my own no sugar, no oil added version by blending hazelnuts and cocoa powder. Yum. But who was I kidding? I wasn't fooling anyone. Anyone but myself. The wonderful thing about your body is that it cannot be fooled. When you have survived in a state of famine for however long you were dieting, and this includes eating clean and forcing yourself to exercise or move more, your body makes adjustments to keep you alive. Your metabolism slows, your heart rate slows, and even your ability to think and concentrate lessens. As famines are a natural part of our evolutionary history, the body is temporarily able to sustain periods of food shortage. When this food shortage becomes prolonged, however, that's when the body must turn to internal resources for fuel. It starts leaching energy from your bones and your organs and continues to slow down or even shuts down systems that are non-essential to life. When you start eating or are around food, your body receives a signal that food is in fact not actually scarce. Yay! In an effort to re you as quickly as possible and therefore repair the damage that has been done due to malnutrition, the body will crave nutrient-dense foods. Carbohydrates, which are broken down into sugars in the body, are absorbed quickly and easily, making them the ultimate molecule to get you back to a state of health. On the other hand, fats contain the most calories per unit of volume of all the macronutrients, making them another ideal fuel source. When your body has been deprived, it will crave foods that will rescue you from deprivation as quickly as possible. So it is only natural that all you want to eat is foods that are high in both carbs and fat. From a biological perspective, the healthiest way to overcome extreme hunger is to eat unhealthy food. Sound contradictory? That's only because of the labels diet culture has given certain foods. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the definition of healthy is beneficial to one's physical, mental, or emotional state, conducive to or associated with good health or reduced risk of disease. With this definition in mind, eating any food that is beneficial to your overall health and reduces your risk of disease is considered healthy. So yes, even all the sweets, fried foods, and thousands upon thousands of calories, as these are all being used by the body to build trust. Now, speaking of disease, let's circle back to the fear of developing diabetes, as this is so incredibly common when experiencing extreme hunger. Before unpacking just why this fear is scientifically unfounded, however, it's important to understand exactly what diabetes is. As you may know, there are two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. We'll get to the differences in just a moment, but in both types, someone with diabetes cannot make enough insulin. 
Insulin is a hormone made by the islets, which are clusters of beta cells, and I won't get into that too deep here because I explain all of that in my book. Um, and insulin is made in the pancreas, and it plays a crucial role in regulating blood sugar levels. When you consume energy, your body breaks down the carbohydrates into glucose, which then enters your bloodstream. In response to the rise in blood sugar levels, the pancreas releases insulin, which transports the glucose to different parts of the body. Insulin acts as a key that unlocks cells, which allows the glucose to enter. Once inside the cells, glucose then can be used for immediate energy needs or will be stored as glycogen in the liver and muscles for later use. So how does this apply to the two different types of diabetes? Well, type 1 diabetes is a genetic condition caused by the autoimmune response against the pancreatic beta cells, making the pancreas incapable of producing sufficient insulin. Type 1 diabetes is a condition someone is born with, meaning it is often diagnosed earlier in life and requires lifelong insulin therapy to keep blood sugar levels in check. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, is developed during someone's lifetime. It occurs when the body becomes resistant to the effects of insulin or fails to produce enough insulin to keep blood sugar levels balanced. It's this second type of diabetes that most people in recovery are afraid of. The fear is that we will become insulin resistant, which means that certain tissues and organs in the body that are responsible for storing insulin no longer respond to the hormone therefore resulting in too much glucose, so sugar, in the bloodstream. And it's prolonged elevated blood sugar levels that can lead to type 2 diabetes. So now you must be thinking, surely I'm going to develop diabetes because I'm already developing insulin resistance by eating way too much sugar. And here's where the science gets super interesting. Having insulin resistance does not directly cause diabetes. In fact, anyone can develop temporary insulin resistance. An excellent example of temporary insulin resistance is seen in some women while pregnant. During pregnancy, the placenta produces hormones that help support the growth and development of a baby. Some of these hormones, including human placental lactogen, estrogen, and cortisol, can interfere with insulin action in the mother's body, making the cells less responsive to the effects of insulin. As a result, more insulin is needed to maintain normal blood sugar levels. The temporary insulin resistance that occurs during pregnancy is a physiological adaptation to supply an adequate amount of carbohydrates to the growing fetus, which uses glucose as the main energy source. Similar to a growing fetus, your body requires lots of energy to heal and repair. As you learned, the reason you crave so many carbs, which are sugars, is because sugar is one of the most efficient fuel sources, and your body is going to do its best to get you healthy as quickly and efficiently as possible. And similar to a pregnant person, which is ironic, as you may joke that you look pregnant <laughs> while you are bloated after extreme hunger, you may develop temporary insulin resistance during your extreme hunger period. I mean, I'm pretty sure I did. However, just as insulin resistance revolves itself when a mother's hormones readjust after giving birth, your hormones will even out as you feed your body back into energy balance. All that being said, you must continue to honor your cravings for sugar if you want to fully recover from disordered eating and make peace with food. Forcing yourself to reel it in will not only increase your mental hunger, but it will continue to reinforce the scarcity within your body, which will only result in the slowing down of the healing process. Yes, you may develop temporary insulin resistance, but the key word here is temporary. The faster you eat all the sugar, the faster your body will trust you and the faster you will be free from your eating disorder. And I mean, isn't that the ultimate goal? If you want to kickstart your journey to freedom, I invite you to watch my free training, How to Win the Mental Hunger Games, in which I teach you just that. How to overcome mental hunger, how to stop obsessing over food, and find that freedom you so desire and deserve. You can watch the training by visiting the link livelabelfree.com forward slash 
mental hunger. And no worries, again, it is 100% free. It's a free training from me. It's like having a private coaching session on demand. It's about 45 minutes to an hour. Can't remember, but that training is jam-packed with values. I kind of guide you through the three essential knowledge steps you need to know about mental hunger and how to overcome it. Um, Yeah, I mean, you're going to get so much out of it. I have no doubt about that at all. I will see you at the Mental Hunger Games, and otherwise, I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye-bye for now! Just one foot in front of the other And you'll see around the corner soon This podcast has been recorded by your host, Liv. This podcast has been edited by my small but mighty Live Label Free team. And the beautiful song, One Foot in Front of the Other, that you are now listening to was written and recorded by my beautiful mom, Louise Alexandra. I am so grateful for my team and everyone who supports Live Label Free. Together, we are always stronger.